So welcome again to our September Qualiware User Group meeting. Before I hand things over to Kevin, um, I just want to mention a couple, just a little introduction about this meeting. Uh, this is my third year, I believe, <clears throat> in uh, participating and, and hosting these meetings. And the meeting, this meeting is comprised of users of Qualiware. <laughs> if you're in the wrong user group, you can go now. That's just a little joke. But it is comprised of users of Qualiware, both customers, consultants, and close reach um, folks. And it aims to provide some useful information about how the tool is being used by these different groups, information about new things coming, plus other complementary topics that we think are relevant for you. This is my annual pitch for needing input from you guys on how these meetings continue to be relevant and evolve. So what topics you would like um, to have included in these meetings, what, what areas of interest, what questions you have, please feel free to reach out to me directly. You all have my email address. Um, you could put it into the chat here if you wanted throughout the meeting. I would really appreciate that so that we can shape this meeting into something that is useful for your hour and a half to two hours every month that you join us for. Um, please tell your colleagues about this um, and encourage them to join us. We do have representation from quite a few clients here, but there are others who I believe would benefit from this who I don't see on this meeting. And so peer pressure is probably the best way to get them uh, to join us and participate in these meetings. So I'm going to hand things over to Kevin now. I'm going to turn my camera off. And Kevin, if you would like to get us um, started with our close reach news, I can then Oh, actually, one thing I did forget, I completely forgot. Sorry about that. Um, just in terms of introductions, I introduced myself earlier. Kevin, of course, is president of Close Reach. He will he will provide us with the Close Reach update in a moment. Also, uh, Kirill uh, Kasanenko is our sales executive. So if any of you have questions about software training services that we provide, please feel free to reach out to Kirill. He will be more than happy to help you and uh, provide you with whatever information he can. And now, Kevin, I'm ready for you. There we go. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back. And uh, one thing I wouldn't mind, if people are interested uh, that are local in Ottawa uh, with sort of the vaccination situation and things like that, uh, we're looking at different ways of reopening the office. And if there's any interested interest in uh, attending the meeting in person, we'll still run it obviously virtually for people who aren't local. But we'd be interested in, you know, drop a note in the chat uh, or send Cecile an email just to uh, let us know whether uh, whether you would be interested in uh, in attending in person, and if you are, if there are any sort of rules that you think that we should have in place, you know, uh, mask wise or otherwise. Anyhow, I uh, want to let people. And I guess the other thing is, if you are in person, we can play some games. Uh, we had our uh, annual company barbecue uh, this summer, and we now have a couple of really fun games that uh, are actually uh, set up in the office. So, uh, you know, if you happen to drop by and uh, want to give uh, have a bit of a game, we've got uh, got some interesting uh, interesting games. Um, Sylvia Lamb, for those of you that know her. Uh, actually, uh, close reach uh, senior enterprise architect actually has been in New Zealand representing D and D there. Uh, for the, uh, they have a group that meets uh, across NATO, talking about uh, enterprise architecture, uh, the practice, and different kinds of things in that space. And we're pleased that uh, they wanted Sylvia to go and uh, and represent D&D uh, uh, &D there. Uh, we are transitioning to a new customer support portal and knowledge base. 
uh, and that's targeted for the end of October. So you should, uh, you know, we hope to have some things ready to show you in, uh, you know, in the next user group meeting about how you'll report tickets and things like that. We had uh, originally planned on going to a particular platform and we sort of changed direction on that. So a little bit of a delay, but uh, we think the new, uh, the new uh, portal that we'll have in place will uh, will meet everybody's needs. Uh, we have QCL scheduled for October and Casemaker in November. So if you've got people in your organization that should be attending those courses, yeah, QCL is going away, but uh, the, I think there will still be stuff there in the in the near you know year to two year time frame that. Uh, you know, those skills will definitely prove useful as we transition to JavaScript, both on the client and on the uh, browser side. Um, Roger Burlton will be running his business architecture course for us the end of October and in, into November, and that'll be six half days. And you can find that uh, all of these courses on our website. So registration uh, you know, is open for those things. Give you a bit of an update from a customer perspective. Uh, Passport Canada is uh, using CBP. We have uh, a services uh, um, uh, contract there right now. Mike Haley and uh, and another consultant have been examining the uh, current uh, processes and. Uh, activities that go on in different some different passport offices to help them resolve uh, the situations that have met, made the news the last little while with all of the lineups and delays and things like that. So we're expecting some uh, some good results out of that. We're undertaking a new uh, initiative with uh, d and uh, called the Digital Navy, and we hope to have something to uh, present there in the next coming couple of months about uh, about that initiative. And we're going back to revisit PSPC, the real property group there. So every department ha typically has a real property organization. So if you want to capitalize on some of the work being done there uh, within your own organization, uh, please uh, give either myself or Kirill a call and we can uh, fill you in. And that's all I have. Thanks, everybody. And welcome okay. back. Okay. Um, we have, by special request, we have uh, Runa Broderson from Koalaware joining us. Runa, if you would yeah. like to, I don't know if you're just going to talk to things or if you're going to, you wanted to share your screen, it's entirely up to you. Presentation, I'll go through uh, one sec. Sure. Ed, uh, my name is Rune. Uh, I've been with Qualiware for about 12 years now. Uh, so I'll try to provide you some news and updates on Qualiware, the company and the product. Um, I am not a developer or a, an IT person as such. I am an architect, a certified architect. Um, but I'm more on the business side than the uh, IT side. Uh, so if you have very technical questions, I may not be able to answer them. Uh, just a heads up. Um, but I will uh, provide you with an overview of uh, what we are doing and uh, what our plans are and uh, how things are going for us. Uh, currently, uh, my position is uh, the head of the customer success department in Qualiware. I have worked uh, with clients uh, many times over the years as a consultant or project manager. Um, I may have met some of you on this meeting uh, some years back. I am not certain. Um, I don't think I've been to Canada since before COVID, so it's been a while. Um, yeah. But if you have questions, uh, just uh, raise your hand, I guess. Um, so first of all, uh, I'm going to tell you a little about how the company Qualiware is doing right now. Um, because things are definitely looking good for Qualiware right now. Uh, we see a lot of uh, 
good uh, signs and indicators that, that things are picking up and that we are going the right direction. Um, some of you may have noticed that we have been a bit more active in creating content for you guys. Uh, and we see a huge uptick in readership and the time spent on the content we create. We see a lot of boost in partner channels and, and partner sales. Um, we have, yes, as it says, over 200% growth in partner sales worldwide uh, compared to the previous 12 months, running months. Um, and uh, especially the growth in new client acquisitions is very positive for us. Obviously, this doesn't necessarily mean as much to you right now, but, but it, it's an indicator for us that we are doing the right things. Um, a lot of our clients are on subscription rather than perpetual. We do both and we don't, it doesn't matter to us, but, but churn is, is easy to calculate. Uh, on subscription and it, it's looking good. Uh, we get about 20 new clients for each client that uh, cancels their subscription right now. And most of the clients that do actually cancel usually move to a perpetual license instead. It's, maybe it's a maturity thing or they started out somewhere and then once it's supposed to go in production, they'll put it somewhere else and then they want the other setup. Uh, but enough of uh, the numbers. Um, you may have seen that we have done a, uh, some things uh, on the company side as well. We created a new website, as some of you may have seen, that we're working on still, uh, adding lots of new stuff. Uh, we have uh, done a lot of more work on uh, social media, newsletters, and these kinds of things. We share a lot of uh, research and, and reports from various sources, um, and, and we try to provide you with interesting content for you guys to, to have a look at. Um, and we can see that works. We get a lot more attention and, you know, indicators such as how long do people spend on the website reading uh, the blog, uh, for example. If, if they're only there for 10 seconds, they probably wasn't all that interesting. But if they're there for seven minutes, maybe they found something worthwhile in there. And so, um, yeah, we see a lot of interesting indicators here. We're also working on a lot of our other client-facing platforms. Uh, the Send Up Excellence is something we're working a lot on right now, and we have big plans for updating that. Uh, we have a new support and ticketing system uh, that we use as well, and a lot of other infrastructure plans that we are moving on right now. So uh, we're definitely keeping busy. Uh, something else that we've tried to focus on more recently is, is about telling your story. Uh, so you all know that we have always tried to participate in various uh, analyst reports. And, and it's, it seems like right now they're all piling in. It's, it's uh, every other day somebody is inviting us to something. And I don't know if they're all uh, trustworthy sources, to be fair. but. There's a lot of activity on that right now, and I expect that a lot of reports will be out within the next few months uh, with us included in it. Uh, but we try to, to stay on top of all these things. We also try to uh, act and reach out to you guys and see if you would be interested in telling uh, your story and uh, telling us how you're doing and what you did and why this is cool or interesting or special. We did a story with Vodacom and with the Department of Transport. We have a video interview with SOS International that we're doing tomorrow. Uh, so if you have an interesting story, or something that you would like to share with us, reach out to us. And we would definitely like to do that. Um, all right. But I think that's enough on the company. I think you want to see or hear about what we're doing in terms of the tool as well. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to go through that uh, in a fairly brief manner. Uh, so the next release is going to be called 10.8. It's, it's Qualiware X for everybody. Uh, but for those of you who are interested in version numbers, it's, it's 10.8. Um, and it's a big release. It's a very big release. 
uh, it's it's definitely one of the biggest that I have seen ever in Qualiware, and um, it has a lot of stuff in there. Uh, some of it uh, is very uh, much targeted on the user experience, and you will feel that every day when you use the tool. And some of the things are, you know, in the back end that you won't even notice uh, those changes. Uh, but I've I've tried to include <laughs> most of the things here um, that we have, and I'm not going to go through this entire bullet list. But I will show some some pictures for you that you can have a look at. Uh, so, for example, one of the things that we've changed that is going to be probably most felt for everybody is we have a new layout for diagrams. Uh, this is uh, a dashboard layout for a business process network. And and uh, you can currently choose if you want it viewed in the old way. Previously, we would just have the model and then the number of tabs above it. Um, and you could sort of dive into specifics there. But now we have, we have added these tiles to show some of the content and it's responsive. So if you select one of them, uh, they they uh, react accordingly, uh, and this layout can be personalized uh, for each diagram type. So if you want to remove tiles, if you want to add some tiles, or if you want to change it in one way or the other, you can configure that and add it to your own personal profile for that type of diagram. So you can have one layout for processes and another one for applications and so forth. Yeah. So that's something that we know that people are going to look and see and feel, and, and it makes it a lot easier to navigate. Um, we have also worked a lot on the modeling capabilities of uh, the tool. We are releasing a table to model uh, feature, which uh, allows you to model, uh, create models from you know, a spreadsheet. Uh, so for all of uh, the people who prefer to work in rows and columns and, and uh, for the people who feel like using the mouse or the cursor is, is you know, is sort of a, uh, a loss or a defeat of some kind, then you have another option now. And uh, it's very easy to use. Um, this is a capability model. Um, typically, you would use this type of feature for either these type of box in a box type uh, models such as capabilities or regulation models and stuff like that, or for uh, more swim lane oriented uh, models like uh, this one, uh, which is BPMN, uh, that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. And, and in this case, you know, the model will automatically uh, identify if it's a start event or an end event, or if the activity path crosses between pools, it will become a message flow and all these things. These are handled automatically and you can map it uh, in your spreadsheet and you don't have to do it the, the other way. It's, it's another uh, opportunity or possibility to do your, your models if you prefer it this way. Uh, we still have, I, I was gonna call it the normal type of modeling that you can do as well. Um, but we're also adding a lot of stuff on the type of model that you can create. So in terms of, of uh, the, uh, the methodologies that we support, for example, uh, we've included a lot on cloud cloud uh, architecture and, and uh, we have support for Azure, Google and Amazon cloud architecture uh, symbols and, and uh, ontologies right now. Um, we are working on IBM as well. Um, so basically, uh, you could create your cloud architecture diagram like this, and then you would choose uh, based on the services that you add to that cloud architecture diagram, which cloud palette uh, you would add those from. Is it an app service or Azure Stack, or is it data databases and stuff like that? And it would, you know, display the right uh, symbols and and uh, layouts for you. Um, and as I said, we do this also for Google and for Amazon. This has been very heavily requested by a lot of people around the world. Obviously, cloud is, is becoming much more important in terms of architecture than it has been. So uh, this is our way of, of approaching that. Uh, we've also added a bit more uh, on the sort of out-of-the-box statistics and, and analysis. 
uh, we've uh, improved or sort of polished a lot of QRVs and dashboards and analytics. Um, for example, previously, if you were to do uh, audits and, and uh, you had your regulatory standards in there, uh, you would do it from regulation models. Now you can do it from requirement models as well. Uh, it's more or less the same process, but a lot of, of these uh, organizations have changed to do uh, publish their content from regulations to requirement models. And so we've, we've adopted that also. Um, but there is more in here on statistics and, and stuff like that for those of you who are interested in that as well. It's a bit more on the compliance side, uh, what I'm showing right now, but it's, it's, uh, it's very important for a lot of our clients. Uh, something else that we have added is uh, the graphical web ontology languages, GAL. And I don't know if this is uh, familiar to any of you, and I can't understand why they call it GAL when it should be GWAL, the way they, they did that graphical web ontology language, not ontology web language, but that's the way it is. Um, anyways, what you're looking at right now is um, an ontology for RESTful APIs. So this is uh, this is the way for to show how systems communicate uh, ontology between uh, in, in RESTful APIs. And we have added a number of, of these. There's a lot of them, uh, these standard ontologies. Some of them are very advanced. Some of them are very simple, you know, addresses and dates and stuff like that. And some of them are like this for RESTful APIs. Um, and we feel this is especially important for many of our clients that are working with APIs and trying to ensure that systems understand each other. Um, some of you may have known that we have also spent some time talking about digital twins. Uh, for us, digital twin is sort of a, it's one of the possibilities you have when you do architecture. Um, and, and this is something that can help you do that with, with the uh, API uh, architecture. Uh, we, can, we can add all these things to your models and, and we can upload all the, the various uh, codes and, and uh, scripts you've used and you can reuse them and stuff like that for your uh, solution teams. Um, we also have reverse engineering of RDF and these kinds of things in there. <coughs> Sorry. Also, uh, more on the analytical side, we have uh, added what we call clustering, uh, which is basically a, an analyt analytic tool that you can use to analyze your content. So let's, for example, say that we have a capability map and there are two or three or four, however many, uh, underperforming capabilities that we have. And we want to figure out what we can do about that. Um, what we've done here is that you select those four capabilities that are not performing and you run a cluster analysis on them. And they will analyze all the content, all the relations and what's in those relations uh, to those capabilities and try to build clusters based on that. So if you want to improve your status or your, your assets, um, you wanna be able to know where you can have the biggest impact and you don't wanna, you wanna, handle things that are highly related to each other in one place rather than four different projects. And so this is a way to, to uh, visualize that. Uh, it, it will visualize it in a 3D model that you can zoom in and turn around and drill into. I can select one cluster, cluster three in this case is a big one, and I can make clusters in that one. Uh, you could also use it uh, if, for example, you are importing a lot of content and you don't really know how to structure it yet, this can be your sort of first indicator or uh, way of analyzing patterns and structures within your data. Uh, so it's a very cool thing that we're we're adding, and there are a lot of use cases for this, and we are only just starting to, to uh, put that in uh, and, and find what has the most impact for you guys. Um, 
also in terms of uh, visualizing things, uh, we also have, uh, call it a model gallery here, but some people would call it the hierarchy. Um, the 3D visualizer can now also just visualize diagrams and you can uh, include or exclude diagrams. You can you can add your entire end-to-end -end, uh, process flow or if it's an architecture diagram, application architecture diagram, you can uh, add all the associated uh, information flows or whatever you want to do uh, in sort of one big model. Uh, some would, uh, if you're familiar with the Milky Way methodology, this is a little bit like that as well. Um, and I can't even count how many times people have said that they would just like to see the models, all of them, how they, how they um, are structured uh, in one place. This is one way to do that. Uh, it doesn't only do models. You can you can uh, do models and then drill into objects and and everything can be included in this basically. Um, and it'll be uh, 3D in layers. It's a little hard to show in in uh, a PowerPoint, but basically they will be in different layers in uh, third dimension as well. And you will see flows within them. Uh, dynamically, things will will move and stuff like that. So it's a it's a cool way to visualize things. Um, following on that, we have other new ways to create layouts. Um, and with this, I don't mean you know to replace your normal model. Uh, these type of layouts are more so used for trying to visualize data that you wouldn't otherwise want to create a model. Uh, so I think we have about ten to twelve new uh, ways of doing that. In this case is a hierarchy view on relations with processes. Um, another example uh, could be, which is called something that's called a forced direct graph layout. Um, this is one of them. Um, we can also work with uh, more dynamic uh, models and layouts this way. If you imagine these simple sort of floating round uh, in, uh, interacting with each other based on the strength of their relations. Uh, so we have parameters we can change on that. Uh, so the gravity of the charge, which basically represents uh, the strength of, re of, of the metadata and the relations. So for example, for a capability, uh, the maturity score is a strong uh, relation to a capability, right? And some associated with is perhaps not, not as much. So, so these types of things that we can sort of work with and play around with. And I don't think you're ever going to use this to create your one finished permanent model, but it will give you a cool little insights and ways to display things and lots of data that you probably wouldn't have mapped otherwise. Um, we also have uh, new ways to show uh, your hierarchy and your repository data. Those of you who are used to QLM will find this very familiar. It's, it's, it's a lot like the object hierarchy views that we have in the QLM, just in the web as well. And whenever you select a diagram, it will be previewed in, on the very right uh, box there. Uh, so when you navigate, your content, you can do it this way as well. Uh, similar, we do that also for um, approving and promoting and creating new revisions of content as well. Uh, we found that some people uh, in feedback would say that it was uh, too cumbersome to do a lot of approvals uh, at the same time, uh, for example. And this is a way that, that we've done to change this. So basically, you check, you can see that there are check marks out here. <laughs> Basically, you check what you want to approve and what you don't want to approve uh, in, the, in the model and on the object layer, and it, it, will, it will add that or promote it or whatever it is that you're working on. So lots of new stuff coming. Uh, this was a very brief overview. Uh, Basically, uh, we have done a lot to change and improve the user experience. We've added a lot of new features, both for modeling and for analysis. Uh, we have 
done a lot based on the feedback that we got from clients and from partners. And uh, it's a very big release that we are looking forward to sharing with you all. Um, so yeah, I hope you liked it. Um, if you have questions on these things, uh, you're free to reach out to me. Um, yeah. I hope you uh, like this presentation and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Runa. I'm sure there are questions. I can't imagine that with this. <laughs> no, I, I imagine so. I can't imagine with this group that there aren't. Um, I'm just, I'm kidding. <laughs> but thank you very much. I really, I appreciate that. That uh, that was very helpful. Folks, cool. do you have a, any questions? Obvious question is when, yes. So first, so the timeline question, Runa, if that's the first question is, if yes. you have any timeline. information about the, timeline. The obvious uh, first question, yes. Um, so uh, I uh, expect this to be out uh, within a month, actually. Mm -hmm. So does that mean you're advertising for someone to come and demo it to us at the end of October? <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> I shouldn't. I'm, I should, tur should turn no, on my definitely. We will show it to all of you. Um, I know you will. I know. I'm just yeah. looking at trying to line up my um, my October uh, agenda. <laughs> <laughs> cool. um, so, uh, yeah, okay, sure. great. Thank you. Carol, I see you have your hand up. Yes, hi. No, thank you very much for the presentation. Looks like it is a big uh, a big upgrade. Um, have you added any other templates for designing diagrams in the web? Uh, yes, uh, we have uh, for the Arctic license. Uh, most of our diagram templates will be available. Most of them? Yeah, uh, okay. that, so there are a few um, diagram templates that have been created over our 30 year history that uh, have never been used by anybody. And uh, they probably won't be in there okay. right off the bat, yeah. But we have, the, as, yeah. As we've added some new ones. There are other things coming as well. Uh, for those of you who are uh, following uh, on other methodo methodological groups, uh, for example, Edgy and these groups, they are releasing something soon that we will be supporting as well, but I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it. Okay. Um, my my other question is like most departments are customizing their own templates by using case makers. So I was wondering, is there a plan to move that over to the web so that they can create the diagrams inside of the web as well? Uh, so like, I, yeah, yeah uh, I know it's a topic. I don't know what the plans are for that specifically, to be honest. Um, I think case maker is not going anywhere right now. Um, and, and it will still be possible to uh, create and configure your own diagram templates. Thank you. Thanks, Runa. Um, Phil, I think that that's your question as well, yeah? It is, but knowing that I can create the diagram in CaseMaker is kind of useless to do because if I can't use it on the web, then that limits us in really going to the web. And that, you know, it's like go web, web, web. I, no, I can't. Not until I see my diagrams being able to be created on the web. Yeah, I think so. that that might be something not to put Runa on the spot here, because I do believe that there have been discussions about that previously, JR. Oh, yeah. Um, we've, it's yeah, a couple of years now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I believe so. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, we can we'll certainly follow up on that for sure. Thank you. OK. Um, and. Bill Sabaran, I see that you have your hand up. That was yes. also your question as well, yeah? Well, it was part of it, right, obviously. Okay. But the uh, the other question, or it's still in that same uh, vein, but is the all of the QCL that we've done and that we still have that are triggered based on whatever uh, stuff that we have within our repository. I understood that the one of the reasons why it took so long to to migrate to uh, uh, to the web is that you wanted to convert 
all if or most of those uh, QCL function to the web so that we can actually redo our own QCL using the, uh, the JavaScript QualiWare function. So is this something that should be out in the next version or we should still wait? Because as uh, JR said, I mean, we cannot go full web until we can actually start uh, pouring our own uh, QCL within uh, JavaScript. Other, other than the uh, the un the, the vanilla version of the some of the diagram we use. Okay, uh, so uh, you can definitely get started on that from this version. Okay, so documentation or it's uh, <laughs> or oh, is I thought uh, I was on mute. Oh God, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, no. That I, as I said, we we with with uh, doing a major update right now on center of excellence, and we plan to do a lot of extra documentation on not just uh, news for ten eight, but much more uh, also uh, use case oriented guidance uh, for users in general. Uh, okay. So uh, there will be lots of stuff added. Uh, to the center of excellence. But this is, you know, not all of it is going to be there from day one. The 10.8 the stuff will, uh, but uh, updated uh, new courses or uh, otherwise uh, will probably be something we add over time. Okay, well, I'm looking forward uh, to see that release in action. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Phil. Okay. Any other questions for Bruna while we? Have him. Okay, I think I I waited the appropriate amount of time. So I I've just uh, posted a question actually to Funa in the chat. Sorry. Okay, so Carol is asking um, general question on Qualiware's vision for the future. Um, I noticed you include more three D visualization tools with the upcoming updates. Is that is the goal at some point to create a metaverse app? Uh, so it's it's uh, it's definitely something that was brought up, uh, but I think we're still a little uh, we're still very uncertain of what that actually uh, entails. Um, what we can see is that uh, for uh, some groups of users, uh, especially newer users, uh, the the patterns of behavior are a little different. Um, the model is not necessarily as interesting for everybody. Uh, some people don't want to create it themselves. They want something generated. Um, but in terms of future, it depends a lot on the technology that you know the metaverse actually becomes. Um, we have tried to do a lot of things with augmented reality and these type of things already. Uh, we have some fun little things that we do on hackathons and, and these kinds of things. Um, but I don't know, maybe. Uh, it's it's not set in stone, at least. No. All right, thank you. OK, great. OK, I think that's everything. I don't see any other hands. I don't see any other chats. OK, um, thank you, Runa, very much. Really appreciate it given the late hour there. Um, Just have there. one more question, uh, Cecile, I'm sorry. Uh, in terms of upgrade path, um, what is the uh, the process involved? Like if we're a couple versions behind, do we need to upgrade? Like is this, a, it will uh, it counter for all the previous updates? You can just go to 10.8 or do we need to move up one version at a time to get to 10.8? Uh, no, I think you can go directly to Senate. Okay, um, thank you. That's but, great. But if I, you know, I'm, no, you should be able to actually. Yeah, not yeah. if you're on version six. That's a little joke. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty old. I'm sure there's well, still yeah, people that's, on there. Well, yeah, that's sort of the caveat, right? It depends how long, how far behind that's you right. are. That's uh, right. There, there may be other things that you have to work with in terms of data and migration as well, if, it, okay. if it's very far. Uh, Excellent. Yeah.
Right. But if anybody well, does have questions about that and what version they're on, to you know, et cetera, feel free to reach out to us okay. uh, to, at Close Reach, and we'll certainly be able to provide you with some guidance. There's also some information up on the uh, the Center of Excellence, um, but there is, you know, um, there is a guidance available. So if there are those kinds of questions. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you, Runa. Appreciate it, given the late hour. and. Uh, Thank you, guys. Maybe Thanks we'll have you back me. sometime. Thanks so much. Sure. Anytime. Okay. Bye, guys. Take care. Have a good one. Thank you. Good night. All right. Great. Thank you. Okay. So um, right now, I would like to invite um, Derek Kahn from ESTC to, uh, to provide his ESTC customer update, Derek. If you're if you're ready and available to go, sure thing. Thanks. Great, thank you. You can share your screen whenever you're ready. Okay, let me just get it in presentation mode. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, so yeah, we were asked to give a, a customer update on. Um, SDC and what we're doing here. Um, basically, the, 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 the lion's part of what we've been doing lately is um, basically we're looking to migrate to uh, a Qualiware hosted service on the cloud. Um, go. Okay. So, and um, we started this procurement initiative in uh, 2021. Um, there's a, a few goals behind that. Um, when we actually ended up uh, everyone working from home with COVID and all. Um, we had response times that were really bad with VPN. We've had issues with shared services. Um, we wanted to simplify our user access to the product, to Qualiware, um, because we also have two instances of, of Qualiware running at the moment, which is not ideal. And uh, obviously looking to align to Department of the Cloud, cloud Adoption. Um, so th that being said, we were migrating to a cloud uh, kind of a SaaS in that respect. Um, that being said, uh, we had an opportunity here to uh, change and, and you know, uh, set up the foundations right for our future installation here. Um, so we've spent a fair bit of time uh, evaluating, you know, one of the most important pieces of all is uh, the repository configuration that we're going to be putting on the putting on that uh, that environment um, to to that we've done consultations uh, EAS and, and mostly my, my colleague Alex uh, had done a, a lot of uh, consultations with uh, colleagues domains uh, other domains and partners within ESDC um, reached out to other departments we went uh, even to you know discussions with Qualware with uh, close reach uh, we reached out to even some external uh, uh, contacts that uh, that he had as well to get some more input on that um, and from that we, we came up and we've set a few different scenarios we, we tried out a few different repository configs we went and uh, did a whole bunch of prototyping here um following those recommendations and those those you know what we had been told um then after that we've been working with uh the help of uh qualiware uh, a fair bit um to develop a proposed configuration uh that'll meet most of the best practices uh, that that we were given and that we've uh that we've we've had added to this um just just a little side note to this is that uh currently uh we're just in the repository like we're we're in the proposal <laughs> stage for this uh, this has not been actually approved and implemented so we're at that point where we're ready to reach out and you know to to, to reach out to different folks and uh get some ideas and, and you know get the ball rolling um so at the moment this is mostly the proposal that we're going to be uh using. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, yeah, so so this is a slide with our current repository uh, setup. Uh, so we're, we're currently set up um, using one repository with you know almost 15 different workspaces. Um, and 
Well, there, there's issues. There, there's certain issues behind that and, and that usage that uh, doesn't quite meet our requirements. Um, so definitely we're looking to limit the amount of workspaces, bring that content back and then you know better share uh, better share the information and, and re revamp a little bit uh, the way we work here at ESDC. Okay, so next slide, this is uh, basically the sum of where we're at right now with most of the work and uh, development and the, the consultations that we've been doing. Um, and some of you may recognize this type of setup since uh, we're, we're not the only ones that seem to have adopted this, uh, this kind of way of working. Um, so the idea behind this is that we would have one repository to do mainly our reference architecture. Um, and one to many repositories where we could do our project work. So be it, uh, you know, a 2B type state of uh, either initiatives or projects or, or whatnot. Um, so back on the left side here, we have our reference architecture. Um, any new type of reference architecture like work in progress and whatnot would be done in the workspace and then promoted to the base once it's uh, once it's approved reference architecture for the organization. In turn, um, using uh, 10, 10 5 and uh, a lot of the web tools, uh, repo repository compare mainly, um, it gives us the possibility to synchronize um, content for, to multiple environments. Um, so that was kind of key for us looking at these repository scenarios. And uh, the vendor, well, I mean, Qualware and Sam and, and whatnot have helped us out quite a bit to validate a lot of these uh, a lot of these requirements. Um, so, so basically, what we can do is we can take the data once it's ready to be shared to other repositories. And uh, with repo compare, you see that little dark purple line. Uh, we can send it over to one or many. It doesn't matter. Uh, repositories uh, for the 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 two B more state of uh, of work. Um, now in there, once a, the the groups working in there would basically be working in the work in progress area, um, working on a project per se, and. Basically, one that, once that's been approved, well, then uh, you would promote it to the base. And uh, so that, that would be your approved uh, 2B architecture. Um, and then we also have the capability that once that architecture is finally implemented, um, then we can, using repository compare again, we can take that uh, data and then we can send it back over to the, the reference architecture repository or uh, or you know they, somebody can create it in there as well. Um, so we find this will give us a, a fair bit of flexibility to to respond to all the the different user needs that we had received uh, during our consultations. Um, now next slide uh, we have here's a slide. Uh, just a, a side note um, is that uh, we were also suggested that we could use configurations. Um, so now with a repository, if you have a need to do point in time, uh, if you would like to follow a project uh, point in time or initiative, uh, we can do that with configurations as well now. Um, so yeah, it, it's just a little added flexibility that we'll have as, uh, uh, for the organization and uh, to, meet the, to meet the changing requirements. Uh, so this is this is uh, just a quick display of our environments uh, that we're setting up in the cloud. Um, basically, I just wanted to showcase that on the production environment, if we're looking at the dark blue arrows at the top, uh, those represent the use of repository compare. Um, so using repository compare, we're able to either manually or uh, by task-based uh, scheduling, um, we could uh, synchronize. Uh, data across the different environments and different repositories. Um, and basically, when you take a, an object, you sync it over, it, uh, it will auto publish as well to the web. So um, that was key to us in the sense that if you're looking towards a multiple, multiple repository uh, infrastructure, um, it's got to be manageable and we still have to be able to, to push changes to the different environments. So um, that was proved out uh, to, to work uh, fairly nicely in our case. Uh, looking at the light blue arrows, um, 
another component to 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 having multiple repositories in there and we didn't want it to get too far out of hand with uh with maintenance and whatnot um is that we have a centralized area that is a standalone repository really that we can use uh, publisher settings now within there we can use that as a our template if you wish for publisher settings for all the other repositories and then uh, same thing there i mean we could repository uh we can uh, move that over from one environment to the other and uh yeah that way uh, we, we share the content between them um other than that well, we still have, you know, if we were moving data between uh, development pre-prod and prod, well, that's still more of a manual process uh, that will need to be looked at and taken care of. But uh, for production, I, we're, we're pretty content uh, that um, it should be fairly simple to move content around in our environment. Um, some of our next steps, basically, we're looking at presenting this to our uh, DMC on, on our side here. Um, and then I know some some folks from ESDC are on this call, so we will be uh, uh, presenting to the DMC, and then after that we're coming uh, to meet uh, the different uh, actors and data stewards and and start working with uh, with different folks to to move forward on this uh, on this. Um, just a side note: the environment is still unclassified data at the moment, so uh, we are. Um, we are ensuring that the data that's going to be transferred over is unclassified in nature, and then uh, as there is a protected environment coming uh, down the down the pipe, down the pipeline, uh, one week does get there, and then we'll be able to adapt to that type of content. Um, so that's pretty much it for my presentation. Just a quick overview. Um, I don't know. Does anyone have any questions or? Thank you, Derek. Phil's got his hand up. Okay, Phil. <laughs> uh, yeah, very nice presentation. And uh, I think at, at D and D, we 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 might be going towards a solution like uh, like you're showing with multiple repositories and moving content uh, again. But <clears throat> I was wondering if you have any documentation that you could share so that we don't start from uh, from scratch analyzing a scenario especially if you have scenario that you tossed away because there's too there are too complex so we could actually take them and toss our own scenario the same way <laughs> yeah um i'm sure uh, i'm sure we can gather that up we do have a bunch of uh, options that were raised and uh, there's a whole analysis work that was done uh, uh behind that so yeah i'm sure we could share that okay and you also talked about the uh HTML uh, publisher or synchronization of between uh, yeah repository that that is a big uh, burden that we have in the uh, D and D making sure that all of the uh, repository that we have are all in sync in terms of uh, publishing. So if you have any uh, technical solution to uh, ease that task, then that's that would be also uh, very appreciated if you could share that. Absolutely, that was one of our big concerns when we were looking at different options, uh, and when we were looking at the multi-repository option, that was that was a big concern on our part was how much uh, how much extra work is this going to give us? And then Qualiware uh, basically stood up and said, "Well, hey, in 10.5, um, you're able to do using repository compare uh, lists and scheduled tasks and whatnot. You're able to automate a lot of that." Uh, a lot of that so it, it, it does synchronize the object but does it synchronize the uh like the uh the javascript no. code generated by the uh so you still need to go and it publish on all or you can also uh, automate those uh publish configuration task because we when we work on a new uh, HTML configuration, then we move it from repository to repository, whether it's with the repository compare or buy import export, doesn't really matter. I mean, one is faster than the other, but you still need to go in each repository and hit the publish uh, configuration so that the, uh, the new template definition JavaScript code is replicated in each project workspace and sub project workspace. 
uh, we have JR uh, on our team is actually working with Sam to uh, to automate a lot of that. So that okay. when our I don't know if you want to jump in JR, but when we do uh, when we have our repository and compare, they're looking to uh, promulgate those changes to the different repositories. So the problem we came up against is your engine is different in every repository. And you have maybe different configurations, so there are some challenges there. And even if you mm -hmm. push the publisher over, you still have to go into that repository and publish it. And it's like, what if I have 100 repositories? There's no way I'm going to do that. Sam and his magic is coming up with something. I haven't seen it yet, but he's got our requirements, and he says he's really close. Okay, so can, can, so can we make others can benefit once we? Yeah, yeah. Can we make a deal? As soon as, as, soon as you receive something from Sam, <laughs> can you send it uh, over our way, please? I, and so, and so, what do they get? To and what do they get him back? What's the deal? <laughs> I'm hearing beer. You're in. Yeah. Dollars. <laughs> I can, yeah, I can. again, I, I think there's a, there's some testing that we're going to do on our end, but mm -hmm. I don't see why we wouldn't share. So okay. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We, we uh, sorry to jump in. We we already do this at D and D, as uh, Phil is aware, and uh, you know, so we'd be happy to discuss what our solution is uh, currently. Yeah, but, but with yeah, I mean, it's not it's not great. Like every time we do a a, a release, it, it it takes well over two hours. Well, I I do I do hope that uh, Sam's. Uh, solution is is more elegant than our and that's where i don't want to share it i don't want to corrupt him with some dnd &D thoughts <laughs> <laughs> let's uh let's see what sam really comes up with yes. i think he, on our call today he sounded really close he had one little hiccup that he's mm -hmm. got to discuss with jacob i'm expecting next week i'm hoping next week so okay we'll see well, you know what would be very nice is if every department would share a major repository of all your QCL code into a JIT hub somewhere so that people could leverage other people's work. Like everybody's, you know, they have all kinds of customization, but <clears throat> I'm sure we could really, uh, we could have some, some, a lot of fun with that. Like we sharing all of our uh, programming code. I think that would be awesome. That's a great suggestion to make to the GC Qualiware Community of Practice, Carol. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Well, what, 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 what we need is not a, we need a technical uh, collaboration. Like mm -hmm. you get the architecture uh, community that sh you share architecture stuff, mm -hmm. but we need a, a technical one. No, like a, a, a techie and a, a nerd. Yeah. Absolutely. It would yeah. be nice to have that central repository somewhere. Mm -hmm. But anyways, I'll uh, I'll consider maybe suggesting it to uh, Danielle. I'll also, I'll also mention it to Kevin as well. I don't know if Kevin's still on or not, but he, at one point he was talking about being the broker for something like that. So let me um, let me talk to him about that as well. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, any other questions for Derek? Great, uh, great conversation. Anything, anything else? I have a question. We... I work for ESDC, Derek. He knows, eh? <laughs> um, I asked that question last week. Um, it, it, do you know if there's an ETA as to when this is going to at least the the, the con consultation uh, at the lower level? Do you know when that's going to start or? Uh, well, we are looking at booking the next meeting with the uh, DMC, so mm -hmm. um, I believe that's not this Friday because it's until yeah, it's day, but the, okay. the, pre the following Friday. Okay. Um, so if everything goes well there, we're, we're looking forward to being able to, to start reaching out to different folks. Excellent. Good yeah. job. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Derek. That was really good. That was really informative. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I have last, but by no means least, um, we have Dragos. I challenged Dragos at the end of our June meeting to keep track of what he was working on this summer so that he could come in September and share with us what I learned about Qualiware this summer. 
And so he's here to do that, which is great. Um, he's going to uh, show you three different things, uh, showing and hiding templates on the web, making queries about you, and hiding buttons on diagrams. So if Dragos is still there. No, I'm not there. And hasn't had a technical issue or anything like that. Um, I would invite him to share his screen whenever he's ready. Thank you, Cecile. Hi, everyone. Hope you had a great summer. I'll share my screen in a bit. Uh, I sure had a great summer, and um, I learned quite a bit since our last user group meeting, so it was difficult to choose um, what I should show you guys. But uh, since it's been a while, I think you guys learned something a little more uh, challenging to learn, so it will be a little bit more of a technical demonstration today. Um, before we jump in, again, please note that the um, following exercises will be ramping up in difficulty and they require an architect license to perform and, of course, a collaboration license to see and enjoy the results. So I'm going to start with the easiest one first. I'll share my screen here. So uh, this first exercise will be to show you how to hide and make visible uh, different repository uh, objects on the web. Like, So let's say you have you have uh, you want to have a certain uh, template viewable in the repository explorer. Um, but right now you can't see it. So let's, for example, create design. And uh, we can see that that one doesn't show up. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, query designs allow you to, uh, through a visual medium, create uh, SQL or QSQL based uh, queries called generic queries which are often the foundation of things like lists or reports. So they, they are pretty important. And a uh, little, little foreshadowing because we will be looking at those soon. Um, but it doesn't seem like we have uh, generic, uh, sorry, query designs here uh, visible. So let's go into QLM and enable it through the HTML publisher tool. So I'm going to switch over to QLM. All right, so here we are on the HTML publisher tool. And in the publisher tool, there's a tab called Repository Explorer. And here's where we define um, the set of templates to be available in the Repository Explorer search on the web. So if I add uh, query design to it and run a publish, then it should show up, no problem. Uh, there are, there's our queues, so if I add query design. Apply and publish, and then switch back over to the web. Just give it a quick quick second. There you go. And I just control F5 to refresh my page. Now if I go back into the Repository Explorer and I search query design, here we are. So obviously that's how you can do it um, for the Repository Explorer, but what about the site search, you might ask? So if I go and open up the full text search here and I type in Create Design, uh, what we can see is that it is visible. Well, um, the settings for this are not found in Q, uh, QLM, but in the QEF Repository Administrator. So I'm going to switch to that for a second and show you how to uh, change those full text search settings. Um, so here we are in the repository administrator. Now, most of you may not see this. This is really for technical users. Um, I would just go to the repository, open up the menu here, and go to full text search. And here's where we define uh, which templates are searchable from the full text search on the web. So if I click edit here, I don't know what happened. OK, brief technical hiccup there. So if I go into the full text search here and click edit, uh, you'll see this list is actually empty. So what that what that's uh, saying is that you can search every uh, template on that list on, or every template available in QLM. You can actually search it through the full text search. But if you were to, to limit that, so if you wanted to hide query design, you'd have to put the full list of templates, you know, business, process, activity, and continue on with 700 more templates and then remove query design to actually um, hide it from that search. And so once you've made these edits and pressed save, you'd go into the service operations, 
and uh, recreate the full text search index. And then um, all of this has to be done while your repository is offline. So uh, once you're done uh, recreating the full text search index, you'd go and you'd put your repository back online. Um, well, so yeah, very technical, but now you know how it can be done and where it can be done. And so we will move on to the next exercise, which is making can, can queries. Can I, can I yeah. jump in for one really quick second? Sure. Do you want questions in between or do you want sure. questions at the end? <laughs> sure, are there any questions so far? Um, I thought I saw someone's hand, hand raised, so I apologize for interrupting your flow. Yeah, this was me again. It was you yes. again. Yes, it was. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> no, uh, I was just wondering if there was any way of, I mean, you, you said that if you don't want to show the generic query, you need to add all of the, them and remove generic query from the list. Query design, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, whatever. Any ways of doing the opposite? I mean, listing the, uh, the one that you don't want instead? I mean, it, it, it uh, seemed counterintuitive to have to add all of the template just to remove one, especially when time comes where query were add a new template, then you need to go back in your, uh, you need to remember if you want to find it, you need to add it versus right. having, because when you look on the HTML, uh, the, the template, the uh, publisher, there is an exclude list, right? Yes. So where you you can actually exclude template versus adding template. A, a, any way of doing it or any way of asking um, where the, to add that feature? Right. Um, I can definitely look into it for you. Uh, for now, as, as far as I know, um, for the full text search part of the functionality, you do um, you did just have to add that list. There's no um, sort of reverse uh, list of things that you so want to want a blacklist from that search. Um, but definitely, I can take that offline and uh, maybe have some answers by uh, the next yeah. group. I, I actually already knew the answer, but if if you could send that to Sam or Quidware as a feature request, sure, it would be great. Sure thing. Great. Any other questions? Thanks, Drago. So you can you can keep going. I'll let you know if anybody puts their hand up. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks. All right, so our next exercise, making queries about you, because who doesn't love having inquiries about them? OK, so the next exercise will show you how to make QRVs and generic queries on the web filtered to the viewer. So let's say that uh, I'm a or you're a contributing member of a repository, and you have a number of um, objects uh, tied to your name. Let's say maybe you're a troublemaker like myself and you have a number of nonconformances. So I'm going to go here into the QRV for managing nonconformances. It's going to show me the, all of the nonconformances available. And I can see myself in the responsible in quite a few places, but not, you know, not as neatly as uh, I would like. <sighs> you know, that's, that's a little frustrating. You know, geez, I mean, I wish there was a way to make it easy for myself and my coworkers. To see only their own items when they visit this list. Well, or not, I will show you exactly how to do that. And I'm not just talking about, um, you know, adding a filter for your name because that's a that's a temporary solution and that doesn't apply to everyone. We want to, we want to make sure that everybody, when they visit this QRV, that they only see uh, objects related to themselves. So uh, to make this happen, we will go over into QLM. I'm just going to switch over. And we'll go over to the uh, Manage Nonconformances QRV. And what is inside a query result view pop quiz for you guys? Anyone? What's inside a QRV, a query result view? What can you always find? There's a pop quiz. I didn't know there was going to be a so, quiz. What's a the query? question? What can you what can you always find inside a query result view, a QRV? Conditions. Close. Queries. Yeah, well, it's, it's the name, right? Yeah. Or generic queries, uh, as the technical name would have it. 
Um, so here's our, uh, you know, our SQL sort of syntax query for managed nonconformances for that list we just looked at. And so this generates that list, but and that's all that's all great. But actually, sorry, this generates that list. Um, I was playing with it earlier. But what we want to do is we want to filter it by the user. So how do we do that? Well, we want our where. And then uh, where does my name show up? Well, it shows up in the has responsible field. So to1.has responsible. And what attribute do I want from that? I want the name. So where my name equals. And here's our bread and butter. So lm script id equals current user name. And what this will do is it will filter the list that we just looked at to um, where has responsible, which is the responsible attribute, um, is an object with my name. So this QLM uh, script ID equals current username uh, will we'll, uh, output your name. Right. So with this, we can filter by name, but what if, for example, uh, I'm I'm not tied to those objects by my name, but I'm tied to those objects because I'm in a position like, let's say, in the responsible is enterprise architect, and the enterprise architect object has uh, my name in there as a position holder. So, we, for example, if we look at this position object here. We can see that the position holders are a number of individuals. And to figure out uh, what is the name of that field, I would go to, so make sure this is my active window, go to file list, and we can see that the attribute actually being used for these position holders is called has position holder. So coming back to our query, if I wanted to add a filter for this as well, I would go or, and then take everything that's here. Now it's saying instead of the has responsible name, what's inside the object that's inside the has responsible, we want the attribute called has position holder dot name. So we want the name of the object that's inside has position holder and that object inside has responsible, which is part of our uh, query. So in doing this, I go to hit preview. We should find stuff with only my name. And uh, I'm going to hop over to the web to show you guys what this looks like as well. So I'd already created a separate QRV here. Called it manage my nonconformances. And here we can see that the responsible is only set to my name. All right, and also uh, important to know is that anybody that visits this QRV, the filter will change to whatever their username is, so it'll be relevant to them. So that's it for this exercise. Um, so, uh, sorry, uh, yep. I didn't I didn't raise my hand, but th does that work well in uh, ten dot three? Because I've uh, I don't have good experience uh, displaying. A generic query using a QRV. You don't have a good experience displaying a generic query using No, QRV. it's either not displaying anything, even though the uh, query itself returns results, right. or it's in a table format that does not look as great as this one, and where you cannot put filter and visualize and all that nice feature. Um, this, I mean, it is a bit of a separate conversation. like. To to get it to look like it would look in the generic query, there's some formatting that you got to uh, play with in, in your file. So maybe we can no, take no, this question no, offline. No, no, what I want is it is my uh, HTML query result view to look like yours. Right. In 10.3 using a generic query. Okay, and you're saying the appearance of it is different. Yes. Right. Uh, well, I can't speak to the appearance, but I, I do know as far as uh, actually uh, writing in the query, it, it shouldn't be any difference between 10.3 and 10.5, but I can't speak for the um, for the visual side of it. Okay, 
Thank you. OK, any other questions? No, nope, there doesn't seem to be anything else to us. You can continue. All right, so our last exercise is called Hiding Buttons on Diagrams and is about obviously hiding buttons on diagrams and it's meant to demonstrate uh, in the grander scheme of things um, how you can make changes to code in Qualiware in a relatively uh, risk-free manner. So um, usually to make changes to code, you need to tamper with files on the back end of Qualiware and its root directory. But with this approach, you can take whatever you need from those files, take whatever code you need, and uh, put it into uh, QLM and modify it and run it into your repository locally. So uh, very small uh, repercussions. So um, I'm just going to switch to QLM. One second. Okay, that's strange. So, yes? can, can I can I ask all of the D and D uh, people to take the following uh, presentation? Well, what's coming in with a grain of salt? Because uh, we don't like people playing with the code and adding features, especially when there's lots of people accessing the same repository in the same private, uh, private workspace. Sometimes it might cause some behavior that are unexpected. And when it comes to uh, our desk, because something is not working as it's used to, it it might save us time if people don't play with QCL and code and all that. That's all I have. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that warning. Um, so let's imagine you have a diagram and perhaps you have buttons uh, on the you know on the business processes and perhaps you have too many of a specific kind of, pro of button like we have here we have too many regulations tied to these uh, business process objects um, so ideally i mean we would limit the buttons but uh, that's not really um, possible you know given what code is available right now but we can definitely um, hide those buttons, or at least certain buttons. So uh, to remove uh, buttons, in this case regulations, um, we, we would go into um, the back end. But first, uh, maybe it's useful to uh, gain a bit of an understanding as to how these are linked, how these regulations are linked to these business process objects. So if I open up the properties here, and I go into associate and then I go into compliance. You see here that this compliance with field is how um, these regulation objects are tied to it. So if I go into the back end and I'm looking for code that's responsible for the button panel here, um, probably I would want to be removing something uh, to do with the compliance with field. So I'm just going to switch my view here. I'm going to go into the back end and show you um, just, just very briefly what that looks like. So here we are, I have um, Notepad++ open. And uh, we want to use it to find um, in the back end what code is responsible for this button panel. Luckily, I already have that function, uh, which I need, which is called, um, here this, uh, it's called get generic butt pan. Um, so we're going to be taking that little piece of code and searching for any file that contains it in the Qualiware root directory. So for me, that's C program files, Qualiware, QEF, slash module, slash QLM. So I'd be looking up for, looking up a get generic butt pan to see if any, if there are any hits in those files. And I do have some hits here, and it turns out that it's in the um, erm.qcl file. Um, so now that I've found the code that I need to change, um, what do I need to do? Well, here's the fun part. Um, any QCL code that's found in QCL files like this one can be um, entirely copy pasted into QLM into what's called a Qualiware setup file. And you're going to run that from QLM. Instead, So if that code is in QLM in a Qualiware setup file, it's going to run from there instead of the back end. So whatever modifications you make through the Qualiware setup file um, will stick, but will we'll, you know, we'll, we'll not touch the back end, but we'll run separately. 
Um, so I'll show you how to do that. Um, but before I switch back to QLM, um, just a quick quick bit on this um, on this function. So uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna uh, describe everything that it does, but it is looking for um, it is looking to create buttons for where we specify that there's objects in certain fields. So in our case, uh, we have compliance with. So it stands to reason that if I remove this uh, little blip here, current instance compliance with, then um, our buttons won't show. So let's see what that looks like in QLM. So usually I would take all of this code, control A, control C, and then switch back to QLM. OK. And in here we would go to in the repository, we would go to quality work setup objects and create a new one. Um, I've already created a new one here and I've pasted the code in. So there's nothing else done to it aside from that. I just pasted the code in. And now I'm going to find my uh, bit of code using control F. So get generic butt pan. I have it typed out here. Business process colon colon get generic butt pan. So if I search that, I'm going to find the same piece of code we were looking at earlier. And we're going to go into where it said compliance with. I'm just going to remove this little bit. And the only thing you need to do for the code to, to take effect is press apply and run it. If you don't press run, it's not going to run until the next time somebody launches the repository. So now it's an operation. I've pressed run. So what you have to do here on the diagram itself is press F5. What that does is it redraws all the elements on the diagram. So if I press F5, now as you can clearly see, it looks a lot cleaner. Um, all of those regulation objects are gone. And in fact, what if if I want um, just this diagram to be without the regulation um, buttons, I could go ahead and publish this diagram and then go back into my quality of our setup and remove like remove the, the, the code or remove um, the quality of setup object that we just created all together. And what that's going to ensure is that um, this published diagram will not have the buttons, but uh, everything else in the repository won't be affected. So that is everything that I had to show you guys um, to summarize our session. We went over um, how to hide and show templates on the web, both in the Repository Explorer and in the full text search. We learned about um, how to filter queries to the current user. And uh, last, we learned how to, about how to make safe uh, or how to safely make customizations um, to quality work code without any sort of long term repercussions. And um, yeah, any questions? So I, I do have a comment again, me uh, again for uh, people at D and D and or whoever would be uh, interested in at D and D. What we did on the but button panel is we introduce a configure button panel. So when you right click on an object like a business uh, process, you have option to uh, hide all the butt pan or configure the butt pan. So then you can click on it and then uh, decide which uh, which field you want on the butt pan. So if, if you want to remove the uh, uh, strategic alignment and the external document, but you want to have the uh, breakdown too, well then you can uh, configure it so that on that particular diagram, it will show only those button and that would not affect diagrams on other other diagram or the same object, not the same object. Well, yes, the same object as well on other diagram. So it really on a diagram level only configuration of the butt pan. Well, that's fantastic. Maybe, uh, maybe yeah. you can share that with me and sure. I can present it next time around. Sounds like yeah. I found my trade. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, I think Dan was interested in that too. I do have to say, and I know it's probably not a, it's a joke in poor taste, but Dragos and I did laugh about butt pan. I have to, yeah. Yeah. I have to say that. <laughs> so uh, I will share the code with uh, 
Dragos, and then from there you can uh, sure send it to whoever's uh, asking for it. That's great. Awesome. Thank you, Philip. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dragos. You learned a you learned a lot. You were busy over the summer. I was. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions for Dragos? I know some of that was a little over the average users. Um, you know, someone just going into Koalaware on a casual basis, but um, uh, James is also interested in the copy. A absolutely, James, not a problem. Any questions, any comments before we wrap up um, for today's session? We've gone over by just a couple of minutes, but uh, we certainly can stay for a little bit longer if anybody has any questions. I think maybe just... I really love the presentation, Dragos. I think my comment would be your your filters that you put in your generic query could live and sit in your query design. So that way, every time you rerun your query design, you'd lose those settings of your filter. So put that into the query design and you won't lose it anymore. There you go. Excellent advice from Jay. And I noticed in 10.4, our relationships always had to be a join. So from one box to another to another, you know, they'd always go to a subquery. In 10.4, if I wanted to put those into a query design, I'd always have to put it to a join. In 10.5, there's benefits and not doing that. You really want to leave it as a subquery. So it's going to really mess us up in our queries when we migrate from 10.4 to 10.5, because a lot of our queries, excuse me, queries, were changed to joins and now I'm seeing the benefits of not doing joins. You can do other things in 10.5, so heads up. But thank you for the demo, it was really good. Thank you. Great, okay, thanks everybody. Appreciate you joining us. Next meeting is, I should probably, I am presenting, yes. Next meeting is uh, the last Monday of October which happens to be Halloween. It'll be October 31st. So we'll make sure that we finish up right on time. So those of you who need to take little ones out for trick-or-treating, we'll still have plenty of time to do that. And well, it'll be the spooky edition. It'll be the spooky edition. Maybe we'll have a costume party at the office. That's an interesting idea. Um, anyway, um, as you heard from uh, Runa earlier, hope maybe we'll have a version 10.8 to have a look at as well and have a discussion about. So stay tuned and uh, do look forward to anyone who has input, suggestions, ideas for content to please reach out to me um, directly. Thanks very much, everybody, for spending some time with us today, and we will see you again in a few weeks.